my context, which is obviously Pioneer, running a project in, in our local neighborhood uh, with people from different uh, faith backgrounds, different theology, uh, different cultures. The issue of worship is a really, really interesting one. We haven't got, if you like, a, a particular culture of standing up and singing songs. However, um, I think both music and food are massive. We've been talking about having our intentional uh, connecting time where we uh, want to devote ourselves to Jesus around a meal ta table. So the idea for us is that we will have what we're calling a, uh, a Eucharist meal together as a community um, where we'll come on hopefully on a Friday where we'll prepare the food and that will be again an act of worship. Uh, think about the Jewish practice of when they're making the bread of you know praying for people that are gonna be coming to the table. So there'll be a lot of thinking around how do we prepare the, the stuff uh, in a worshipful way, in a prayerful way. And then uh, that, that will season for the, for the next day. And then we want to gather around uh, a table of food um, to be able to come as a community and just be intentional about welcoming Jesus to be with us uh, as we eat together. In terms of some of the music, my community is very multicultural. It's very multi-faith and we're really keen to bring in some of that that flavor into how we how we worship god through music we're doing a lot of um street stuff a lot of hip-hop i mean i call it hip-hop the young people call it something different getting young people on the mic some dub music and stuff like that really wanting to bring in other things like poetry and storytelling stuff that really connects with the different cultures that we have in terms of exploring who God is and journeying with, with, with God through those mediums. One of the um, amazing things about my neighborhood is uh, it's full of people who encounter God in very different ways than I have traditionally encountered God. And I can tell you stories you know, that happen on a, on a daily basis of being in a conversation or an activity with somebody else and feeling the presence of God there. I recall many conversations that I have with some of my um, Muslim friends and as they speak to me about uh, their God, I, I just get that sense of God there. Uh, within those conversations saying hey Simon you know open up your eyes a little bit uh, and you will see me in the most unusual places when reflecting on Covid in my neighborhood and also when reflecting on uh, um, the death of George Floyd and Black Lives Matters and all the images that, that we're seeing. You know, for me personally, and, and my, you know, my community that's, uh, again, very uh, multi-ethnic, it has been a really difficult time of trauma. And I don't know how to fix it. And I think it's, I've, I've been in a place of just having to be in, in the questions and, and be in the pain um, and hold that every single day. Inside I'm crying out, I'm saying, God, will you do something about that? Will you do something about this? But I think God, again, he, he, he's not calling me and I don't think he's calling us to be in that place of victory, if you like. I think he's calling us to be in that place of the cross, which is that place of being broken. Um, yet, within that, I think he's saying, but I will be there with you. I think one of the things that the COVID has highlighted 
is the injustice, both particularly in our political, social and economic systems, but also I think in some of our church systems. Other than Sunday mornings, where is the church within in my neighbourhood? You know, I really appreciate that for many people, the idea of um, leaving Sunday morning and coming in spending a week here, hanging out with me at the, the community centre in the neighbourhood is, is terrifying. Um, and they'd be like, oh, we don't know how to do this. But isn't that the point? You know, we're not called to have answers. What we're called to do is to rely on Jesus. You know, he says, I'm sending you out and I will be with you. He's given us his Holy Spirit to be uh, a helper. So I, I think if you're not a little bit nervous or scared or even terrified, you know, then that, that's probably more of an issue because you then approach it in your own strength. I think to fully step out in faith is to put yourself in a situation where you have to say, God, I have to rely on you here because I do not know how to do this. I've been asking myself this question for probably the last 20 years now. What does the kingdom of God look like in Welsh House Farm, which is the neighbourhood that we, I live and work in? And I've been trying to sort of like understand um, God's kingdom uh, and his, his plans and purpose, purpose for our whole neighbourhood. So rather than having this idea that um, some people are in and some people are out, you know, and you're in if you come to the centre at a certain time and a certain date, um, it's, it's really thinking it from the perspective that actual fact everybody's in in the sense that God has a plan and a vision for the whole community you know regardless of who you are you know if you live in Welsh House Farm then uh, that then God is for you so that's the, really the question that I've been asking myself what does kingdom of God look like for Welsh House Farm I see a lot of newer church plants in the city who tend to place themselves in more affluent areas, in more middle-class areas, in more white areas. Um, and I see people very reluctant to, if you like, church plant, if you like to use that language, or set up shop within the more poorer, marginalized areas. Yet when I read the Gospels, when I read the, we read the Bible actually, I see God right amongst those people who have been excluded from the rest of society. So what does church or what does Kingdom of Heaven look like in Welsh House Farm? I think it looks like Welsh House Farm. I think it looks like a whole bunch of people who are have been marginalised, who are trying to make sense of life who are struggling with issues with financial issues, uh, mental health issues, issues of injustice, issues of racism. But what they're doing is, is, is they're calling out and saying, God, you know, be with us uh, as we, we try to make sense of everything that's going on around us. When thinking about the wider Baptist family, I think what I would love to see is us getting back to our roots. What really drew me towards the Baptist was the all of the, the subversive behaviour the Baptists are supposed to have. Um, I think over the years, maybe we've become too comfortable. Uh, maybe we've started to 
you know, like our position of recognition uh, within a wider society. You know, most people know what it is, you know, what the where the Baptist church is or what, what generally that a Baptist is a, is a recognised church. But I think for me, we as Baptists are called to subvert the structures and stuff like that. I, and I have conversations where um, some of the conversations I have with people is they, they can be quite fearful of change and they can be quite fearful of challenge. It's almost like God's not big enough to look after himself. So when you, you, you mention something, they go, oh, you can't say that. That, that, that can't be right. But it comes out of a place of fear. So I think another thing that I would love to see um, within the Baptist uh, family is maybe just a, a letting go of some of that fear and a, and a trusting. I, I guess I have this image of Peter stepping out of the boat on the water. I mean, what a crazy thing to do. All logic, all understanding says you step out of a boat onto water, you're going to drown. But there was something about, again, just letting go of that fear and stepping out of the boat and not knowing. And I think I'd love to see the Baptists uh, do both of those things. Let's not be so afraid of difference and different ideas. And let's start challenging again and subverting again and going off and upsetting people so that you know we, we can be the church that we're supposed to be.